from HV Studio. This is the Unnerved Banter. Thanks for joining us on the Unnerved Banter. My name is Chris Fricky. This is going to be a little different of an episode. You may be used to the story format. Don't worry, we're still gonna have those, but we're introducing a new segment uh, that's more of a conversational platform. We're going to talk more in depth about certain unnerving topics and news. And so we're gonna try releasing the story podcast every other week and the unnerved banter every other week. So alternating back and forth and see how that goes. So on the first episode, I have my good friend, Jeremiah Harlow, and we were roommates in college, neighbors, still good friends. And we usually have these kind of conversations anyway. So, uh, Bear with us as we're a bit rusty. I'm trying to figure out how to do this episode, but I promise we'll get better with time. So bear with us. I think you guys will enjoy it. And thank you guys so much for listening. Jeremiah, how are you doing? Hello, Chris. Welcome <laughs> yourself. To yeah, the thank you. I'm doing, I'm doing good. How about you? I am fantastic. Thanks for asking. Uh, so this is like, I don't know, the eighth time we've tried to record this. So, you know, hey, no, no, this is our first time. First. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. Is the first time. The first topic that we're going to get into uh, this story uh, I came across, uh, which kind of freaked me out. And maybe it will freak you out as well. It's something that I think all of us can, you know, somewhat um imagine would be terrifying i don't know many people who like dark small places um especially for long periods of time anyways i think claustrophobia is is pretty common i'm not as claustrophobic as i used to be when i was a kid my brother my older brother used to wrap me in blankets and sit on me and that was terrifying so i guess i i developed a little bit of claustrophobia from that and i'm better now like i don't mind being in tight, small places, but not, not for too long anyways. Um, are you claustrophobic at all? Um, you know, I'd say somewhat a healthy somewhat. amount. I'm a, I, yeah, I mean, I don't like to be in a place where I can't move. I think that's just pretty normal for most people. You know, you watch those videos of cave divers and stuff that squeeze through those impossibly yeah. small spaces. And I, it, it freaks me out to think of that, you know, to think of being less in that space, um, just like physically, but more the idea that if you did get stuck, there is no way that anyone could get you out. I mean, yeah, you're so far underground that yeah. the technology just doesn't exist for that kind of thing. So that's pretty, dare I say, unnerving to think about. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, it doesn't bother me, especially if I can mind over matter it and say, <clears throat> like, yes, this is claustrophobic. But if I did actually get stuck in this closet or whatever, someone could physically come and just cut me out of here. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a mental thing that I can get over most of the time. For sure. But yeah, I, I'd say yeah. I've got a little bit of it. OK, yeah. And so much of our fears that we experience of as humans is so mental um to an extent obviously it depends on the scenario but um yeah and people definitely have gone caving or whatever and and have died because they've gotten stuck you know loss of oxygen or whatever like that's definitely happened but today that is not the story uh we are not talking about caving necessarily but um yeah let's just get into it so the story begins in 1891, so quite a while ago. A woman named Octavia Hatcher, she was 20 years old and gave birth to her first child. His name was Jacob. And early on, unfortunately, the child passed away. Soon after birth, I'm not sure why. Uh, I 
didn't see that on my research, how the child passed away necessarily. Um, but she sank into a long depression. Octavia was super depressed and she then fell into a coma-like state um, and was not responding. Uh, so um, she was then pronounced dead on May 2nd, 1891. And yeah, it was thought to be from a broken heart. There was no pulse and she was announced dead. And uh, someone I haven't spoken about yet is her husband, James Hatcher, um, obviously was devastated. Um, he had lost his firstborn baby and now his wife. So uh, a little um, fact about the area she was at. I don't remember if I said this or not. Um, she was in Pikes, or sorry, Pikeville, Kentucky, uh, is where this is taking place in 1891. And during that time in May, uh, apparently it was extremely hot weather at the time, and embalming was not a thing uh, back in those days. So if the body was dead, they had to go about things quickly because it was hot, um, bodies began to stink, um, so they moved the process along pretty quickly. But after they buried her, they had the service and everything else, uh, they noticed something. Uh, in the area, other people in Pikeville were also falling into similar patterns. Uh, they were uh, going into comas. They were sleeping a lot, or starting off sleeping a lot, and then going into comas, but not dying. Um, they would eventually come back um, to regular breathing um, patterns. Their breathing was normal, um, but... Uh, this, at the time, wasn't known, um, but they think that at the time there was a mosquito-borne uh, illness, encephalitis, if you will, um, that caused people to go into this deep sleep state. And it also um, made you breathe slowly. Um, your, your pulse was low and this was just a side effect of it. People also think maybe um, nearby coal mines were putting off some sort of off gas that was also making people sleepy. There's different theories, we don't know for sure, but definitely um, the mosquito-borne encephalitis was definitely a recorded thing. The coal mine thing is just kind of a theory. People don't know for sure. So these people, they're falling into comas, they're waking up, they're recovering, this has her husband James and the family thinking, huh, I wonder if this is what Octavia had. Was Octavia really dead? Was she still alive and we buried her alive? So they went to dig up Octavia. And when they opened the coffin, they saw an unnerving sight, something that horrified everyone there. Her fingernails were all bloody, and the lining of the coffin was shredded, and her face was contorted. Um, she indeed was alive and awoke in her coffin. Um, perhaps, you know, soon after she was buried or a couple days after, regardless, she was alive. Absence of news accounts of this newsworthy event is often called are often cited by its critics as proof that it didn't happen. Um, what's fascinating about it, though, is the family, James and his family, had, um, they were kind of a more prominent, rich family, um, and they um, owned thousands of acres and had more of a fortune in the timber and coal mining industry. And uh, because it's such juicy gossip about burying your wife alive, um, there are reports that they um, kept people from putting it in the local newspaper because it was bad. Uh, it was just a bad business decision. Like it doesn't look good uh, title. You know, we buried our, our, <laughs> our loved one alive. That doesn't look good for the family um, because it was a giant mistake. And so people assume that there wasn't news coverage of it because the family had a hand in it and they were more powerful and controlled more of the newspaper and didn't want the news getting out. 
Um, so when I first read that, I thought, oh, well, maybe this isn't a true story then. Um, but the fact that it was from 1891 and there have been absolutely no changes to this story. Typically when there's a legend of sort, there tends to be changes to it, you know? Like there's no consistency. Like, uh, for example, episode two, Creature in the Woods, um, if you listen to that episode, there's a lot of legends in that area of Sweet Hollow Road. And people uh, have added a lot of things to legends there, um, so much so that it just becomes unbelievable because things are constantly changing. But this story is very consistent and hasn't changed, um, even though there is not a news article necessarily about it. Um, so yeah, Jeremiah, uh, I sent you the photo of her gravestone. Do you see the gravestone in the picture that I sent you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll post it on our Instagram uh, so you can look at it also. But um, her tombstone um, is impressive. I, I will say that much. It's a it giant is. statue um, of her. And um, not long after his wife was um, exhumed and discovered that she was alive, and then they buried her again, he then had a sculptor sculpt um, a beautiful sculpture <laughs> of his wife, and that is her official tombstone, and it's still there today. Uh, and then do you see the photo um, to the bottom right? Do you see that tombstone right there? Mm -hmm. um, that is also a carving or sculpture rather of um, their child right there. And then directly under her tombstone or her, her sculpture is his tombstone. So there is that proof there. And like I said, you guys can see that on the Instagram Page. But yeah, Jer, what are your initial thoughts? Can you imagine waking up in a coffin? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you you look at this this uh, tombstone or sculpture as well here, and I mean that tells you that they most likely had money, especially if it was that long ago. Yeah. Because it is impressive. Uh, it's a it's a fairly large. Uh, sculpture and I mean it looks looks lifelike that's so yeah that that checks out I think it does sound horrifying obviously I mean you would have no idea what was going on um I don't even know I guess you could probably figure out that you were in a grave but you think you could even if it was pitch black like I yeah. guess, yeah, I guess that would probably cross your mind if you woke up, maybe. If you're in a hospital and then you, all of a sudden you woke up and you're in just total darkness in a small space and, um, like a I mean, box. it would probably yeah. connect. It, it, it's hard to imagine what your state of mind would be at that point. Yeah. Um, and she may have been out of her mind even, you know, she may have been feverish or hallucinating. If right. she was that sick that she, they thought she was dead, you know, that, like, who knows, but. I mean, that, so, evidence for that, you know, it seems like, is kind of touch and go, like, there's yeah some evidence, but, I mean, have you heard of the bell that they used to put at at the gravesite? Um, oh, interesting. The, so, you you do know about this, then? I do, yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. I, there, it's, do you want to share not, what you know of that? Well, I mean, I just know that throughout history, it's not uncommon for this to happen, Um Throughout different periods, there were there were reasons for it, and then some of it was connected to folklore. Other other bits were connected to. I don't know if you would call it lack of of medical um, competency, or just lack of understanding of kind of what happens or what can happen uh, with someone being sick. I don't know. There's a lot that goes into that. Like I said, folklore stuff too. But I just know throughout history, it's been a thing. You know, people would would think that someone was dead um they would get buried and then somebody would hear a pounding 
underground, you know, a day later. So then there was a period, and I don't know if this is the same period, but where they would tie a bell around your toe, um, a string that is, up, and then it would run through um, most likely some kind of small tube. Tube up, or something. Yeah, yeah to, to ground level. And then there would be a little bell hanging there. And that was so that if you did wake up and you weren't actually dead, they would hear the bell ringing and they could come dig you out. Um, like I said, some of that I think is tied somewhat to folklore and and um, legends, uh, you know, of people sort of reanimating and even vampire stuff and all that because yeah. obviously if you're going to that length, I would hope instead of just saying, well, they're probably dead, let's just put a bell on them and let it be. Uh, I would hope they would do a little bit more diligence to make sure that they were actually dead in addition to adding the extra measure of a bell. Um, right. But I guess sometimes you just can't know, uh, as this story kind of proves. You know, you. know, Yeah, and I didn't look too deeply into if that is like a historical thing, the whole bell thing, but the story that I found, it says at the end of the article uh, that the man, James, the husband, uh, that when he died... Uh, that he had a string tied to his finger, finger, toe, whatever. Mm. Uh, and it ran, uh, yeah, to the ground, uh, ran, ran up towards the ground where there was a bell at the end. And so if he was alive, he could ring it and someone could hear it. So, uh, again, you know, like you said, whether it's folklore or not, uh, you know, associated with different lore stories. I don't know. I didn't look into specifically the bell thing, but I guess it makes sense. I mean, especially if the story is true, um, you know, I'm sure people in the community, especially were like, okay, how can we prevent this from happening again? Oh yeah. The bell well, system would work, I guess. And when medical, uh, ability obviously is not to the level where whatever was going on could be, 100% trusted uh, I think I would take that extra step too you're just like well who knows what's happening maybe science can't tell me at this point but all I know is that people are waking back up so yeah uh, and I've heard of stories I mean you know actually modern stories of people waking up in morgues uh, or whatnot. so you know this isn't uncommon to people I mean uh, sorry let me say that differently it isn't super common that this happens, but I know it has happened in, throughout history in one way or another, where people are pronounced dead and then they come back to life. Like, that's happened. There, there's proven historical stories. Uh, this one, you know, if the theory is true that the family, the prominent family, with, you know, didn't let local newspapers run this story, I mean, that may just be a cover-up to say it is true, uh, but it does say in this article I read that local historians do agree that this is true, even though it hasn't been in the newspapers or reported that way. So I don't know. I mean, it hasn't changed in years, though. It's been the same consistent story, too. So mm -hmm. take it for what you will. If it's true, I don't know. Um, but I guess this scenario we can all imagine would be, yeah, terrifying. That, that would be an awful way to go. You know, she ran out of oxygen ultimately. And, and yeah, that's a rough way to go. Yeah, that's horrifying. Would you say that probably 50% of people that they think are dead are actually not? You're asking if 50% of them are actually alive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if those are the statistics, then we've all made a horrible mistake and are a complete letdown <laughs> to this planet. That's awful. Oh, so you're saying a higher percentage. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I had to think about your question because it was so ludicrous. I was like, wait, 50%? That doesn't make sense. That's what those are, are awful. Saying? Ludicrous? No way. What if we're <laughs> what if we're wrong about the human lifespan and halfway through we just take a really big nap? 
Yeah, and if everyone just waited, like, I don't know, like, waited, like, 24 hours or something like that, that's when we come back for our second wind. That's when we mm-hmm. start our... It's like a rebirth. Like, we're good to go again, you know? And then we actually start to de-age. We start going back to, you know, like Benjamin oh, Button, you Benjamin know? Buttons. We go backwards. Yeah, that's what I think. Hmm. Makes sense. That is unnerving. That is <laughs> unnerving. I Yeah, I mean, waking up in uh in any way similar to that would be i mean just worst case scenario really just waking up in general is is unnerving but yeah waking up in a in a box is definitely unnerving so and i mean honestly just for the family you know i you were saying like a cover up you know maybe they were powerful and maybe they had some say with the the newspaper um owners or whoever it was at the time but I mean, at the same time, it would be so unnerving for the people remaining alive as well that I could see it being a thing they didn't want aired or known just because it's it was so horrifying to them. I mean, and you can imagine. embarrassing, really. It's embarrassing. Like, Yeah, I mean, sort of. I, I don't see it as embarrassing to the family because obviously it, it's not your responsibility when a doctor uh, tells you to that's double true. check. You know, you don't that's go in true. there and... Say, well, let me get a look, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a- like anger and and um, frustration and just, you know, total horror, like hor- horrified, you know, just completely horrified by that prospect would be my my imagined reaction because just knowing that your your loved one was, was down there, you know, and, and suffered that fate is you know far honestly far more unnerving than than the person who actually experienced it because they you know they pass away so it for them it's this time of of terror and and then you know pass away but then the the people who know that it happened but then have to live out the rest of their life you know they they've got to then live with it like it's That's crazy it's interesting. like somebody I- who goes through a terrible experience but then um you know dies as a result like it's it's horrifying for them but for a short short period of time whereas for people who like in this case you know they could have could have saved her like they then live with that knowledge the rest of their life like that's yeah but that's a fascinating thought though i haven't thought of that so you're saying it's almost better to be her in the coffin than the family because they have to live their whole life out knowing that they buried her alive. You're saying it's better to be her and just like get over with kind not, of a thing. Is that not what you're saying? Not like, necessarily. Like if you had to better. choose, if you had to choose between the two, okay, her husband and her, yeah. like who would you yeah. choose to be? Well, so, I mean, obviously it, it's a, it's like a moral dilemma, you know, but I would say you a better way to ask that question would be if you gave the husband the opportunity to switch places, would he? Oh, good point. Yeah. You know, and I think he would. I think he would. Yeah, totally. He would rather experience the horror and yeah, you know, just total, total fear and then ultimately, like death of being trapped in there himself, than be the one to survive it. You know, that kind of classic. I mean, it, it's like that ultimate love of sacrifice, you know, whether it's a parent for their child or, or you know, a husband for a wife or whatever that situation may be is it, a lot of times, yeah, the person who survives it would much rather have taken the fall, you know, and, and seen their, their loved one make it through. Um, and so, yeah, I, th- I think nobody would want to be the one that got trapped underground obviously and that would be far more terrifying an experience and then ultimately uh, death but as far as the unnerving aspect of it goes like yeah i think that the husband who lived and had to you know live with that reality the rest of his life um you know that that's i think he would have i think he probably gladly would have traded places you know so that yeah i automatically think of her situation Mm -hmm. um and what she had to go through but you're totally right too like he has to live the rest of his life knowing that Um, yeah yeah that's awful 
All right, so that is the story of Octavia Hatcher. And next, we're going to go into unnerving news. All right, so (laughs) (laughs) this is a segment where we're going to um, talk about actual current events, actual things that are happening now, or at least, you know, somewhat recent. Uh, I came across this story uh, just the other day. Actually, actually, it's been less than a week uh, this story broke. Um, yeah, this this is fresh. So uh, I sent Jeremiah the video. Um, we're going to play that um, now so you guys can listen to it also, and then we'll talk about it. Investigators tonight sift through salt looking for body parts after a grim discovery by TDOT workers finding what police say was a heart in this McEwen salt barn. I've got 32 years in in law enforcement and, and I do have to say this is probably in the top five of the most bizarre things that I've ever seen. The TDOT workers had initially thought it was a rock but were suspicious. They called police who sent it off for testing revealing it was an adult human heart. They did act out of suspicion, and my hat's off to them. And, you know, they, they got to thinking, you know, and, and when they got that first inclination or a doubt in their mind, they, they made the right call. Where the heart came from and how it got into a pile of salt used for treating roads is unknown. Humphreys County Sheriff Chris Davis says it had been there for a while and had hardened out of dehydration. Somebody somewhere knows, and, and, and you know, we're seeking information, and I always reach out to the public if you happen to have any idea or just an inclination. As the TBI help make sure there are no other body parts at the salt barn, Sheriff Davis thanks the decision of the TDOT workers who got this investigation started on an uneasy feeling. I'm very appreciative of that and um, hopefully when we can find uh, the rest of the remains and the, the family I hope will be thankful for that as well. At this stage DNA testing is being done on the heart to try and find an identity. It's an investigation we'll follow. Michael Warwick, WSMV4. All right. So a human heart found in a salt stockpile. What do you think of that? That's that's bizarre. (laughs) Kind of an interesting one. I mean, there's just so many weird, weird points to that. I mean, just, just the heart for one. Yeah. In a sock, in a salt pile. I mean, that's bizarre as well. I mean, what like how how does that make any sense to anyone? Like what what did you expect to happen from that? It's not going to disappear. Yeah. You know, it's not going to go away. Salt doesn't decompose it, stuff, you know, it, it preserves stuff. Yeah, it preserves, but Yeah. I mean, yeah, just it's very strange. It's not really you know, usually with with stories similar to that or something you could kind of come to some conclusions or at least have theories. But I don't know. I mean, honestly, that's a weird one. That's a really yeah. weird one. The only yeah. thing that I could say potentially is, you know, that a lot of that salt, I think, comes from um, salt flats and that kind of thing. Um, even like seaside salt beds in other countries and then is shipped over here. I don't know. But I almost wonder if it hasn't been in the salt for a lot longer. Right. And, yeah, and, that, and got shipped over from somewhere else. And maybe those people were Egyptians and they were doing just a little bit of... Too much human sacrifice. <laughs> well, I think, you know, they're just like, they're preserving some, you know, future mummies. That could be... And they drop a heart on their way. I don't know. No, I'm kidding. So I, but that that does come to mind. Like, I wonder if it hadn't been there for a long time, but not necessarily at that facility maybe just wherever that salt came from before or who knows along its journey to get to that facility from potentially all the way around the world so it could be it could be anything i i wonder if they won't you know find nothing right right and my automatic thought when i came across the story was you know like okay where on earth did they get the salt mm-hmm. um I mean, okay, but even before we get to that, you know, that, you know, how you always, from my understanding, uh, start an investigation, 
um, you know, especially a crime scene, which this is definitely being treated as a crime scene. You know, you start, you know, at the crime and you branch out from there, you know, um, slowly, you know, making your, your search larger. So locally, uh, a lot of people were saying like, oh, well, it's this guy. There's some guy that has been missing. Um, gosh, I don't have that up right now. But a, a missing person um, has been reported there. I think it's been over a year or so. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, and so they're like, oh, it must be him, you know, because it's a male heart. Um, but the the police have have spoken to that and they don't think it's him. Um, they have no evidence that it's him. I mean, they're doing DNA testing on it right now, but even if they do get, you know, all the DNA testing, you know, once they put it into the databases, if it doesn't link to anyone, it's still, you know, they don't have anything. They don't have a mm-hmm. match. So mm-hmm. as of right now, this was five days ago, I believe. Um, and they haven't had a match yet. There hasn't been a reporting of a match. Okay. So there's locally... You know, was someone trying to ditch a body? That's a very strange way to ditch a body. Um, and like they said in the video, they were sifting through all of the salt to see if there were any other body parts, body remains, and they didn't find anything. I mean, initially they came across the heart. I read somewhere that they have to sift through the salt anyways um, before they put them in the dispenser trucks because the machines if there's like a big rock or a stick like it can get caught up in the machine Mm -hmm. and jam it so they have to sort through it anyways so that's how they came about the heart that's how they found it so they didn't find any other body parts they treated it like a crime scene they looked everywhere didn't find anything else okay so that comes to the question um where did this come from if it wasn't locally it must have been shipped in you know that that was my thought so uh, as well like you said like you know they probably partner with all kinds of salt mines um locally there are salt mines um and they're in tennessee there's salt mines all over there and i read somewhere that they get salt imported from up upwards to i believe they said like 20 like different salt places you know salt mines you know salt companies um that's just a a comment that I read. I don't know how true that is. So, you know, they kind of have to, if they're mixing salt from all these different people, they get the salt from, you know, I don't know if there is a way to really trace where it came from. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it could have come, like you said, another country, it could have come from there in the States. Uh, I don't know if there is a way to track that, but, you know, obviously as an investigator, that would be my first go-to is like, where did this specific batch of salt come from? Um, yeah, I, I just don't know if it can be traced. Well, and it's such a strange thing to find. I mean, if you're even some someone trying to dispose of some evidence, uh, murder or something, you know, get rid of a body. I mean, you you don't really need to separate out the heart for any reason. Yeah, you know that, like that just doesn't make much sense. You there's there's no you know ev- that there's nothing regarding a heart that ties you to a person or that even identifies a person themselves it's it's fairly insignificant when it comes to a person as a whole um and identifying them so if you're trying to dispose of something like why why the heart and why just the heart you know yeah and that, why that location like typically it's yeah then buried, you get into yeah. why the salt why you know that that's a whole especially other thing. even if they had found it just laying in the woods it's kind of like well why separate out the rest of it yeah or, or go through the trouble of putting it anywhere much less in salt and then why just that you know it would have been maybe made more sense if they had found other items you know other other parts sort of scattered throughout or something like that where it's like oh obviously somebody's trying to cover up but why would you cover it up in something that preserves evidence well that's Um, probably just ignorance or maybe maybe it was all planned i don't know yeah another thing um i found out about the the dot uh where the salt is stored the whole facility has a giant fence around it and there's cameras everywhere uh, 
so I, I really, you know, either, you know, security is just bad or whatever, you know, it, it is bordered up to, cause I looked it up on Google maps. Um, it is bordered up to like a forest, I guess. It's also, you know, next to a large donor facility. Yeah. Large donor. It's, it's right across the street, actually. Um, I don't know why they haven't put that together yet. But, you know, if someone was coming from the forest, they would have to hop this giant fence, dig under it, whatever, you know, and then be like, oh, let me stash it in this salt. Like, yeah, I don't know. Either someone has to be a complete idiot or, you know, I, like you said, I, I it makes more sense that it was shipped there. I mean, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, as far as it getting into that facility, but even then, it's, it still doesn't make much sense why someone yeah. would have just a heart, you know, and why it would end up in salt. I mean, unless it was some kind of, uh, you know, insane individual that was it attempting to preserve it, you know, oh. that, that, that could make some S- sense. So you're saying like a cannibal or something like that. They're just trying to keep it for longer. Maybe there's yeah. a cannibal in the I mean, woods. It wouldn't necessarily <gasps> that could have be to be it. that. It could, it could be, it could be somebody that's just, you know, a psychopath that's trying to preserve um different parts or something i don't know the cannibal in the woods makes sense to me i mean it it does make good sense pretty strange i will be uh definitely following this story i try to follow it every day to see if there's any new developments but uh, i mean especially when it comes to dna and matching it you know if there is a match you know this could you know this could be one of those cases that potentially never get solved or at least it takes years you know to, to yeah. be solved man i really hope it is because it would be just so interesting to know you know i mean i say the thing about a donor like this is one of those just wild and wacky things that like you almost would it wouldn't be surprised to hear that say a donor you know truck like a medical um truck of some kind was hauling um, different organs that had been donated and were, you know, transplant in route and then got in a wreck. And everybody thought that, you know, the <laughs> truck burned up, but like somehow one of the hearts like flew out and they were nearby. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that wild that, you know, yeah, some kind of story along those lines yeah, coming to light would not surprise me because it's just like, how else? I mean, how else? All right, that's going to do it for our first episode of the Unnerved Banter. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that episode. And if you have any questions or perhaps comments about the episode, we would love to hear from you. And a great way to do that is by leaving a voice message. All you have to do is look in the show notes and there will be a link there that says speakpipe.com forward slash unnerved podcast. Again, that's speakpipe.com forward slash unnerved podcast. And that is where you can leave us a voice message and we may play it on the next episode of the unnerved banter. Also, if you guys could please rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcast, that is super helpful for us and we really appreciate it. All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.